طب ذيس اور فيرست سيشن نعملها في المكتب اند يعني وي فيري اكسايتد تو دو ذيس ترايل وي هاف ان شاء الله سم بيبل اون لاين وي هاف سم فيزيكال اتنديز وي هاف انستغرام واحنا وي بلان تو دو ات افري تو ويكس وذ ا ديفرنت ورك شوب سم ار تكنيكال سم ار جنرال سم جست اوفر ذا سيكتور فلي مي انتروديوس ماي سيلف ماي نيم از خالد شرباتلي اي ام ا بارتنر اند ا تشيف انفستمنت اوفيسر فور ديزرت تكنولوجيز Um, what we do at Desert Technologies, we're a smart infrastructure company powered by the sun. So what we focus on is everything related to solar technologies, batteries, and hybrids. Can go to electric chargers, can go to digital uh, smart infrastructure, uh, and everything really how to generate power, clean energy, to power the, f- the, the future infrastructure. For today, I want to speak about the renewable energy sector in general. a bit about climate change. I'll give you a bit of a background. Um, I studied uh, management and finance, and I'm part of the B20, G20 Climate Energy Task Force. I have a fellowship from the IMF, and very specialized at tackling climate change and how can we improve the future of energy and energy generation. Uh, is, my fa- is my pace fine, and or should I? Okay, okay. so this presentation is going to be in English. If you have any questions, you want me to explain anything later on, I'll be more than happy to do that. Can, can people online hear me? Yeah, I think if you can just write in the chat. Anyone who has a question, please write in the chat. Inshallah, we'll answer it. Uh, can we start the video, please? I'll start with a Human short activities video. activities from pollution to overpopulation are driving up the Earth's temperature and fundamentally changing the world around us. The main cause is a phenomenon known as the greenhouse effect. Gases in the atmosphere, such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and chlorofluorocarbons, let the sun's light in, but keep some of the heat from escaping, like the glass walls of a greenhouse. The more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the more heat gets trapped, strengthening the greenhouse effect and increasing the Earth's temperature. Human activities, like the burning of fossil fuels, have increased the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere by more than a third since the Industrial Revolution. The rapid increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere has warmed the planet at an alarming rate. While Earth's climate has fluctuated in the past, atmospheric carbon dioxide hasn't reached today's levels in hundreds of thousands of years. Climate change has consequences for our oceans, our weather, our food sources, and our health. Ice sheets, such as Greenland and Antarctica, are melting. The extra water that was once held in glaciers causes sea levels to rise and spills out of the oceans, flooding coastal regions. Warmer temperatures also make weather more extreme. This means not only more intense major storms, floods, and heavy snowfall, but also longer and more frequent droughts. These changes in weather pose challenges. Growing crops becomes more difficult. The areas where plants and animals can live shift and water supplies are diminished. In addition to creating new agricultural challenges, climate change can directly affect people's physical health. In urban areas, the warmer atmosphere creates an environment that traps and increases the amount of smog. This is because smog contains ozone particles, which increase rapidly at higher temperatures. Exposure to higher levels of smog can cause health problems such as asthma, heart disease, and lung cancer. While the rapid rate of climate change is caused by humans, humans are also the ones who can combat it. If we work to replace fossil fuels with renewable energy sources like solar and wind, which don't produce greenhouse gas emissions, we might still be able to prevent some of the worst effects of climate change. All right, so I started with a video from National Geographic, which is something you can find on uh, YouTube or online, okay? And the reason is just really simplifies the whole problem. The problem is the greenhouse gases, whether it's coming from energy, whether it's coming from transportation, livestock, and other sectors, it's harming the world as we see today. And it doesn't just cause weather changes. Weather changes, they cause 
a problem in, in the ecosystem of places. So animals can go to different places, disease can move from one place to another, and, and some species go extent, extinct, which, uh, which really harms the whole ecosystem. If you realize, the past 20 years, there has been so many new diseases, as you see COVID and others, and a lot of it is related to the climate change and the climate crisis, because animals move from their natural habitat to somewhere else, moving different types of diseases with them, which is not where it, which is where it shouldn't be. So one of the ways to fight climate change is by producing clean energy and clean electricity. This goes through the utilities, which is what we do in our houses, how we use our electricity, goes into transport, goes into the way we plant uh, our, our plants and the way we raise the livestock, the processes. If we optimize this and if we do energy efficiency, we can cater to the growing population of the world and have a sustainable future. And that's the whole plan. The plan is not to stop oil, stop energy, or, or find completely alternative new ways, but to have a sustainable way that energy and, and the way we live uh, can be sustained over hundreds and hundreds of years for the next generations. So today, I'm going to speak about renewable energy specifically and smart infrastructure. I'm going to focus on the Middle East and Africa. If we have any questions, just please put in the chat or ask me in person. Type. So long-term solar outlook. So there has been a huge growth in solar energy demand uh, in the past 10 years, 15 years, and that's mainly driven by two main forces, which is the mass production of solar panels, as you can see here, which China led. So in Europe, a lot of technologies have been developed, but we couldn't use, use these technologies until China took these technologies and made mass manufacturing and mass production, mass uses of, of these technologies and investing in the manufacturing of these technologies. So once there is mass production, the price goes down. When the price goes down, demand follows, goes up, and then it becomes more feasible to use renewable energy. Just to give you an example, in Saudi Arabia, it costs the government somewhere around 45 halalas, so around 14, 13 dollar cents, to produce one kilowatt of electricity. Okay? Today, with solar in the kingdom, we can do that at five halalas instead of 45. So if you can see the price difference, it just drives policy, it drives technology, it drives investments to go and invest in these new technologies. In different places around the world, probably solar isn't the solution. So in Germany, for instance, they get half the solar radiation as Saudi. So maybe wind is more suitable. In Iceland, there is wind is, is not a big case because it's, it's a small space. And then solar is not the case because there is not much sun. So they use geothermal. Yeah? And, and that's getting energy from the ground. So each place around the world has its specific technology that's suitable for its natural you know, uh, ecosystem. And that's, what's called, that's what we call sustainability. Some technologies don't work somewhere, some technologies work perfectly somewhere else. Uh, so taking a look at the demand, today I want, to get, I want you to get out of this session with some key points, which is understanding what does kilowatt, gigawatt means, what does energy demand means, and, and where we're going. So by gigawatt, the word gigawatt, the whole Saudi Arabia infrastructure is 65 gigawatts. The whole kingdom, okay? Egypt is 45 gigawatts, and the population is three times. Nigeria is around four gigawatts, yeah, yeah four. give or take. And how many people? Over 250 million, yeah? So can you imagine the gap? 30 million people in Saudi, 64 gigawatts. 100 million people in Egypt, 45 gigawatts. Nigeria, to over 250 million people, with only four gigawatts of capacity. So that's a huge problem the world is facing. And as you can see, the demand is growing. So this data is until 2018. Usually it gets renewed every year, two years. But this is, this is something very close to where we are today. So the whole global demand in 2018 is coming close to 150 gigawatts. This is increasing rapidly. So probably by this year, we're at 250 gigawatts demand. Next year is going to be 300. The year after, 350. And it keeps on going up and up. Okay. So I'll go to the next slide. All right, so the short-term outlook. 
Over the, the left side, you have the global solar PV installed capacity and investment. As you can see, it's going up to over $180 billion in 2019. It did not stop with COVID. It actually just accelerated even further. And the biggest part of this demand is from solar PV. Why? Because it's easy to install, it's cheap, and, and, and the investment in this sector or this specific technology is, is very lucrative. The returns are good, it's cheap, it's easy, anyone can do it, and, and the whole market's moving towards that uh, sector. So, so the additions by segment, this is a bit more technical, but there's another term I want you to understand is utility scale and distributed generation. The difference is utility scale is what the government builds. So a government builds a power plant, they sell to the electricity company, the electricity company sells to you. That's a utility scale. The government will own the, the, the main power plant or will get investors to develop this power plant. Okay? Distributed generation is what you would put on your house or what someone would put on his mall or someone would put on his factory. It's distributed across. In Africa, it could have a bit of a different meaning. It could mean places that don't have access to electricity. So villages, each village would have its own little system and the whole ecosystem is called distributed generation. Yeah? And where we're heading today is the distributed solar generation. And this also drives the technology because in solar, we can build a small plant that's only $5,000 to power a house. With wind, you cannot do that. Minimum could be $2 million, $5 million, right? With solar, you can go up to billions of dollars. It will be the same system, same technology. It's very scalable, and it's very quick to deploy. Wind might take two years. Solar can take three days, up to a year and a half, depending on the size. If it's a house, in three days, you can install a system. Wind, it's not the case. Geothermal, obviously, is not the case. What's similar could be a diesel generator. And put a diesel generator very quickly. So solar is in competition with the diesel generator. Yeah? Can we go to the next one? All right. So another concept is called the levelized cost of electricity. Okay? The issue with renewable energies in general is that there is a very heavy upfront cost. With oil, you can buy a gas station or power plant or a diesel generator. It will not be that expensive, but then you'll have to fill it, just like your car, every three days, every month, every two months. And there's an ongoing cost. With renewables, you have to put the majority of the investment up front. So you're buying a solar system, you're going to buy electricity for 25 years, today. So there's always a, a gap between what do you want to spend today and how much you want to save over time. So this cost, this 25, 20-year cost, we call it levelized cost of electricity, LCOE. Okay? And this levelized cost is calculated with the investment you put today, the life cycle of the product, and the output you get from it on a yearly or daily or, or monthly basis. And as you can see, the solar PV levelized cost of electricity has dropped from $4 per kilowatt all the way down this is even further driven down to approximately 15, 10 cents. In Saudi, it's two cents. So if you take this graph and put it in Saudi, it will go till here, till this point. Two dollar cents will go to 1.5, will probably go to one cent. So the cost, the overall cost has been dropping dramatically. I'm sorry, I didn't. So the overall cost has been dropping dramatically. And and here, as you can see, also the LCOE of solar specifically in different countries. And if we add Saudi Arabia to that, we'll be at the lowest point. Why? Because we have irradiation, we have sun, we have the perfect climate for this technology. So I'll go to the next slide. All right. So as you can see, there is an obvious boom in renewable energies in the, in the, in the region. The, 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 the was 47 megawatts installed in 2010. 47 today is a very small plant somewhere, yeah? But the whole capacity of the Middle East was 47 megawatts. Today, or 2018, it was 6,177. By today, I would estimate it's around 8,000 after the last Saudi programs, 8,500. And in the next 10 years, this is going to grow to probably five, six digits, right? 100,000, 110,000, maybe even 150,000. Saudi alone, 
and which I'll go to the next slide. Um, no, no. Can you go back, please? Okay. So Saudi started with two megawatts. 2018, it was 34 megawatts. 2019, it was 344. The spike was one power plant with aqua power, which is called Sakaka Solar. Only one plant. This year, we have seven plants under construction, total 3,000. And the next year, probably there will be another eight or nine plants with another total 3,000. So this number will jump to 6,000 in 2023. And then it will jump to around 60,000 by 2030, which I'll get to on the next slide. All right. So looking at other countries, in 2010, Egypt was the leader. In 2019, the UAE became the leader, with Saudi really picking up. But Egypt and Jordan really were the two first countries in the region to take this renewable energies program and take it forward. Why? Because energy is very expensive for them. For us, energy is a bit cheaper because we produce oil and the government subsidizes it. In Egypt, the subsidies are not as much as Saudi. In Jordan, in, in Jordan there are not much subsidies at all. So it's a no-brainer to have your own solar system with your own batteries. You're just going to save money from day one. In Saudi, with the probable increase in electricity prices over the next three, four years, you're going to find a lot of houses with their solar plants on top. Yeah, because it depends. If it's cheaper to, to stay on the grid, you wouldn't think about solar. But when it becomes more expensive, people will look at different generation uh, aspects. But there's another point. Other people also try to save energy, right? So it goes together. Power generation and energy saving, they go together. We, we always reduce the power consumption, and then we add a power generation aspect. I'll stop at this point. So if you have a house, okay, and your utility bill is 2,000 riyals a month, it's not right to just go and buy a solar system right away. No, go check your fridge, check your ACs, check your uh, appliances, check your chargers, cables, everything in the house. Make sure you reduce your consumption to 700 riyals, then go get a solar system so you can really have the proper savings. Right? And that's what's happening. So over the next 10 years, our power consumption will remain quite the same. It will not increase dramatically because of the energy savings. And then we will replace all the utility scale gas stations with solar, wind, energy storage, etc., hydrogen. Yeah? All right. So there are a lot of energy programs around the Middle East. Uh, you're looking at the UAE, Iraq, Bahrain, Egypt, Jordan, Kuwait. Maybe if you want, I'll share this presentation afterwards so you can take a deeper look into it. The most optimistic program and the most, honestly, I think the, the program with, with the biggest impact is the Saudi Vision 2030 a Renewable Energy Program. So I'll just, I want to touch on this a little bit. So the Saudi Vision um, Program is run by two main bodies. One is the Ministry of Energy under an office called DREPTO, Renewable Energy Project Development Office. Yeah? And then the second is run by the PIF, the Public Investment Fund. And the plan is to invest $200 billion in renewable energy in Saudi by 2030. So far, the past two years, we've had six, seven billion dollars of projects. Every year, this number is increasing. And a lot of international players are set up in Saudi they are investing in Saudi to build this renewable energy um, infrastructure by replacing the power plants we have today by more distributed generation power plants and specific programs. So what did the government do? They made 33 different parks. It's a park. Every year, they put a plot or two plots out for developers to come and invest in these plots. And these plots are all across the kingdom. There are wind parks, there are CSP parks and solar parks. If you can see the solar parks, they're much more than any other technology. That's because we have sun and, and we have irradiation. So it's, it's the perfect technology. So what did the government do? They did the soil test, the wind test, everything you need. They created something called the Atlas, where any company can go online and, and, and see what's the study for the specific site without going physically there. Everything is ready and they can build their uh, power plant based on these assumptions and their investment based on these assumptions. And these plots that go out every year are put out for bidding. 
So the owner of the cheapest price with the best quality that complies with the regulation will get this plot. Usually seven, eight, nine, and each company will only get one project. Some companies get two, that's if there are no competition. Yeah? We got, we got two plants, we got one in Medina, one in Rafha. Uh, last year, alhamdulillah, we're, 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 we're doing it now as we speak. And it's 20 mega and uh, 50 mega. So it's Medina is right here, and Rafha is somewhere here. All right, so what's really important is localization. And the reason why the government is not just putting the programs out overnight and spreading it over 10 years is to build an industry. Okay, and that's what China did. So how do you build an industry? You build an industry by manufacturing, so localizing the content that goes in, by development of the human resources, so building the capabilities in-house, by, um, by supporting local co contractors to go and build these plants, and by supporting local developers to invest in these plants. So that in five years from now, a lot of the players in Saudi will be big enough to go and bid in the United States, to bid in China, to bid in Australia, in Africa, in Europe, and develop you know, a market, or, or how, how can I say this, leaders and champions that can go around the world and be the leaders in this. And this is very similar to what we used to do in the past, because Aramco, Sabic, uh, Sadara, all these big oil and gas companies are the ones that really the leaders in the energy market. So we need leaders in the future of energy and, and focus more on petrochemicals instead of burning oil to get energy. You can create energy with different uh, methods such as renewables. So localization, the, 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 on, on the right, on the top right corner is the easiest items to localize. So you have the tower, for the wind, you know, we can localize that, it's a, it's a structure. And then you have the module assembly and inverter assembly, which is, this is a module, solar module. We can localize this. Today we have a factory that does this, I'll, I'll, I'll cover it later. And this is a huge uh, government, it's a program supported by the government. And then blades, so the blades that go in the wind turbine, we can localize it in the future. And then when you go to sell and Housing, it's a bit of a long term. It's not easy. And then you go into polysilicon and wafer, which this is a long term solution. These are mainly commodities that you can buy from China, but eventually you need to localize it. Because how do you create jobs? And how do you increase the GDP contribution? By localizing the investments of the manufacturing. So a developer would have 20 people, and they would develop projects with $2 billion, right? Only 20 people, 30 maximum. It's not much of an added value. But a contractor will probably have 500 people to do that, while a factory will probably have 1,000 people to do that. So manufacturing creates jobs and very high um, paying and, and, and specialized jobs. Because manufacturing of renewables is as futuristic as uh, the renew the, the how, how we how we perceive renewables usually have a lot of automated machines usually it's programmers on the on the line instead of labor usually every the whole process is automated so it creates very high uh, value adding jobs <clears throat> let me go to the next slide all right so i want to speak about africa africa is extremely interesting because africa has 750 million people who have limited or no access to electricity. 750 million people. And all of these people, what they do is practically they buy batteries like the power banks, yeah, with five, ten times the price we buy it at, just to charge their phone, or use diesel, diesel generators where they go to other villages to, to charge their phones, and then they use their phones to pay, to pay for stuff. It's like a bank, okay? So to f they don't have light, they don't have AC, they don't have uh, different things that are very basic for us. And what they do is they pay a huge premium to get the simplest services that we get on a day-to-day -day basis. And these people make money. They sell crop, they have livestock, they trade. Some you know, uh, are small contractors that build houses. They have some money and they're willing to spend on electricity. So. The, the, the way we used to do things in the past, where we big, build a big power plant and just you know, put millions and millions of dollars of cables to go power a village of 200 people, 
It's not going to work. So the case for Africa is more distributed generation, which is small power plants and villages. And you can't do that without solar and batteries. Okay, you can add a diesel generator, but where are you going to get the diesel from? Usually it's very hard to ship things to these places. So with distributed generation, we can light up the whole continent of Africa and really produce clean energy for their schools, for their little uh, perhaps hospitals, for, for, um, for just, just to live on a day-to-day -day basis, for small uh, and medium businesses. And we're seeing a huge increase in, in, in um, renewable energy, or specifically solar PV uh, resellers, resellers and retailers in, in, in Africa. What do they do? They sell small home, so, uh, home systems for the houses and they lease them and people pay monthly with a small like solar panel and a battery that can power the house. Others, what they're doing is building a container, so like we're, we're, we're doing this now, we put a container with solar panels on top, batteries inside, and then we can power 100 houses, 200 houses, and sell this electricity as we go. So the demand is insane. It's huge. South Africa is leading. South Africa is more institutionalized. It's, it's a developed country, so it's it's one of the leaders in this program. And uh, I'll, I'm, I'm not going to speak about Egypt and North Africa. I'm just speaking about Sub-Saharan and South Africa, yeah? because Egypt and North Africa is a completely different place. So there's a lot of programs that are going on, and year on year, this demand is increasing. Let me just go next slide. All right, so this is what I touched on, mini grids. So what we do is put a solar system with battery, probably a backup generator, and then power, um, power um, small places, houses, factories, etc. And there's just information for you to see. So how many megawatts are installed? What are the invested capacities, etc. Okay. So I'm done with with the market overview. I want to touch maybe a little bit on desert technologies and what we do. All right, so desert technologies, we're one of the only companies in the world that are all over, uh, that are fully integrated across the value chain. What does this mean? We do manufacturing, we do contracting, so we install, and we invest in developing these power plants. And we do that through different arms, mainly PV manufacturing here in Saudi, EPC, over 160 to 200 megawatt track record by today, operation and maintenance, uh, project development and investment, and then we exit uh, the assets. So these are some of our projects. This is a project for Aramco in Tabuk, NCB Bank, the rooftop. Uh, we did this really cool project for United Nations in a country called Togo where it's a, it's, it's a solar street light with a charger. So we did 10,000 of these. Valeria, right here, she's been the project manager, which working in such environments is, is extremely difficult. You're literally in the middle of nowhere with no access to anything. And we have to install 10,000 of these lamps with local contractors and training them and developing them. So it's, 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 been, it's been very tough, but it's a project that we're all proud of. And uh, we have pictures of people using these uh, little you know, also to, to charge their phones and, and, and to carry the daily activities. Um, this is what a utility power plant looks like. So it's a big plot. You see hundreds of thousands of solar panels, usually on trackers, and usually it takes a big investment. These are our plants. You have Jordan, Jordan, Egypt, and Egypt. Inshallah, next year we can sit in our, or probably the year after, I'll show you Saudi. This is how manufacturing looks like. So, you know, fully automated processes. And this is how microgrids look like. So this, we did this project for Neom uh, Rally Dakar. We powered the campsite. You see the container with the solar panels on top. We put three of them, and this powered the whole campsite. And we can see more and more of these projects in the future. Finally, we can use these containers for electric vehicle infrastructure and charging of cars and boats. Type. Today was a very short, straightforward, inshallah, session. Um, I hope you got a good idea about the sector. If you have any questions, whoever is here and online, just let me know. I'm more than happy to, to answer all the questions. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, 
سوري بالعربي بالعربي ما فيش مشكله بس على الامان على المدى الامان على المدى البعيد للتكنولوجيا يا سو سو وي وي تيك هيلث سيفتي اند انفايرمنت فيري فيري ستريكت فيري وي فيري ستريكت اباوت ذا اتش اس اي كودز اند اس اتش اي بروسيجر وي كول اتش اس اي and maintaining the site security, maintaining the technology security and safety, and maintaining the technology is going to live through warranties, through the suppliers. We go to the bill of material and we check, is this material suitable for this area or not? And solar panel will look the same everywhere you go. However, the components that go inside are different. Just like a phone for $100 and an iPhone. They look the same, no? But, you know, if this falls one time, it's done, the other one can live. And we take care of that. Uh, a lot of companies do, uh, some companies don't. However, overall, the system is built to live 25 years under the sun with no problems. You just need some cleaning every two months, every month, depending on the location. Any other question? Like, for example, if I apply a solar system at my house, is there like a feed in tariff process? No, okay, so, so today, there is no, okay, there is a net metering process where if you have an additional capacity, you put it to the grid or you, you, you export it to the grid and they can pay you a different, uh, the difference or, or a fee. The government is finalizing this and should be out in the next two to three months. So what, it, what he's saying is if I have a solar system on my house, what happens if I travel and the system is working, right? The electricity will go down to the grid, the government will pay me the difference. So I will produce for the grid. Totally. Okay, we have a lot of limitations. One is lack of manufacturing, enough manufacturing. Mm -hmm. This year, the prices has been going up a little bit, okay? Not enough manufacturing, especially with China uh, and COVID and, and all of this. Number two is not a lot of investments in the sector, so we need more investments in the sector. Number three is sometimes the weather conditions. Some places, as I said, we cannot put specific technologies. Like wind would be suitable somewhere more than solar, and solar somewhere else. So, so we look at renewable energies in general, and then we see what fits the place. We work in solar, so we focus on countries that that solar would be efficient in. I mean, and also manpower. We don't have skilled people. Usually we have to train from scratch, especially in the region. Very difficult to find someone who knows how to operate a manufacturing facility, or someone who knows how to install you know, a large scale project. We have to get people from outside, but we're, that's being develop, developed as we speak. Other questions? Sure. Okay. Um, I'm curious to know, Yanni, is this uh, the solar uh, technology or system save, um, you know, save energy for Yanni? When the sun is go out, it's gonna, it's gonna stay working or what? When, when the sun goes out, it stays working? Yeah. Okay, it does not. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on this. Maybe I just need to exit the presentation. Okay, so, so it does not save energy. This produces energy only. You need a battery system to save the energy. Usually, for the small scale, it's a small battery. Lead acid, lithium, supercapacitor. For the large scale, it goes into different technologies of batteries. If you heard, there's a hydrogen project that's being built. This is part of a storage solution. So solar panels only produce. They don't store. You need a battery to store the electricity, which makes it more expensive. However, if you have a diesel generator, you can use a diesel generator at night and solar panels during the day. If you don't want a diesel generator, you're willing to pay a premium, you get batteries. In some places, like Africa, batteries are cheaper than diesel generators. So, so it's much better to get the, the, the batteries. Other questions? Please. Yeah, usually the systems are connected online through an inverter, and we can monitor online the, the production throughout all the power plants on, you know, an iPhone. And usually for the large plants, it does need people to be on site to do this, the maintenance if there's anything that goes wrong, especially if there's moving parts. When do you really need maintenance if there are moving parts? Solar doesn't move. If you put a tracker, then probably you need a bit more maintenance. You put an automated cleaning system, 
you'll probably need some maintenance. And all of this we can monitor it online. So we know each panel, how much each panel is producing electricity at all times, real time. And if there's a problem on site, we know which panel would have a problem or which string, which is like 10 panels, would have a problem. We'll send someone to check. Now there's also drones being developed that can go up, measure the heat that's coming out. If the panel gets really hot, more than the ones next to it, then there's probably a hot spot or there's some shade that makes it get heated. We know which panel we know and we go and fix it and change it. And the way power plants are built when it comes to solar, it's, it's like little plants, a lot of little plants. And each row or string is connected to one inverter. There's a problem, we know which inverter, we can stop it right away. So if there's like a fire and it's on one string, it doesn't go everywhere. It stops at that string and we contain it and we go and we fix it. I touched on these two. So one is really lack of manufacturing facilities and, and, and manufacturers. So we need to develop the ecosystem. Two, not a lot of investments in the sector, which needs to increase from the private sector. The government is already investing. The private sector needs to invest more in this sector. And, and three, not having enough uh, qualified personnel to work in the sector, which needs a lot of training and development. The transition, transition takes time. We don't do it overnight because one main issue with renewables is that it's fl it fluctuates, it's not stable. The sun can be really hot one day, can not be hot the second day, can, can, we can have clouds, we can have humidity, so the power output changes. Wind can sometimes come in quicker, sometimes it doesn't come, so it fluctuates. And this fluctuation, if it goes down, it will disrupt the grid. If it goes up, it will also disrupt the grid. So you need a stable grid at all times. Today what we're doing is that solar is not that much, so the fluctuation doesn't make a huge difference. But in the future we're going to have this problem, so we're going to need batteries on the grid, like hydrogen batteries, lithium-ion batteries, supercapacitors. So when there's a spike, the batteries take the spike and store it. And then they release it when the, the, the production goes down. Yeah. Good? I think there was a question here. Chat. Okay, what is the biggest challenge? Yes, okay, perfect. So I think we're done today. Thank you all for attending. Um, please stay in touch with us if you have any questions. Uh, if you're interested in the sector, we're more than happy to have. This is our first session. The, the whole point is to really um, meet people, create content, and, and you know promote the industry. In two weeks, inshallah, we're going to do a session in Riyadh. Our chief commercial officer will do it, uh, Majd Rifai. He will speak about localizing the, the, the manufacturing in Saudi and localization. Inshallah, next month we'll have engineer Noor Musa, probably speaking about microgrids and... And, <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll keep doing, inshallah, some technical sessions uh, for engineers who are interested in specific topics. Like uh, we have, mashallah, all sorts of engineers on board from electric vehicle experts to battery experts to solar PV experts, sales experts in this, in this, uh, in this field, uh, construction experts, HSE, and Chala will, will do this more often. All right, thank you. Bye-bye.